Um, okay. All right, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Friday, July 21st. My guest today is a man you all know, obviously, uh, Jackie Martling, joke man, joke sponge, as he actually is. I just watched his documentary yesterday, which is on Amazon Prime right now. And, uh, and I am beside myself thrilled for you. I have to tell you, I think that it's a long time in the making, yeah? Long time, and we were on, after two days on iTunes, we were number six. And by yesterday, we were already number four. We were, we were number four, and Yogi Berra was number five. So to see my face and Yogi Berra's face on the same screen, you can't, <laughs> even, you can't even put a price on that. And it's doing well on Amazon. It's on a lot of different platforms. I know nothing about them except that I know it's good, <laughs> you know, so. I have to tell you, I, you know, when I, when I was first watching, oh, and that's what I wanted to ask you. Do you remember when Grace and I came to your house and they were recording you, like they were filming us doing, was that the same team? No, um, I don't know how long ago it was. I don't know if it was Tom Ellis, but it was probably the guy, diff, a different set of guys that wound up not doing it because they were taking the whole, a whole wrong, not Approach. wrong, but they were taking a whole tack of, of what an idiot this guy was to leave the Stern show. And, and Ian was like, no, you, that's not your story. Your story is the Stern show and the jokes and your life. And so we moved on with Ian Carr and IKA Collective. So, but I'm not sure that could have been anybody. That might've just been my friend, Ed, that was there shooting footage. You know, so there's so much footage flying around that I, all I do remember was what a great time I thought that was. See, I have to tell you, as I was watching the documentary and I'm watching you like, you know, making food and you had like three people around the table whom I don't know who any of those people were that were sitting at the table with you as you were just kind of telling stories and things like that. I don't think people realize that that's who you are. Like you're that guy who is as 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 nice as you are, gregarious, as you are generous, as you are exactly what you see. Well, they were very random. It was my new friend, Ron Barba. And we. I said, listen, I'd really love to have some fresh ears for the silly stories and stuff. So he just grabbed a couple of his pals, uh, friends. The one, uh, the African-American girl, Heather, was, they were fans, but they weren't like fans that knew everything. They were just kind of people who liked the show and liked me. And, and it, you know, so it was kind of, kind of preordained, but not, you know, and it was so... There was such a great audience for the stories and it was, it just worked perfectly. You know? Loved it. I loved it. And I, I also loved and thought it was kind of ironic that both um, Opie and Anthony, who were so wonderful in the documentary as well and had such great things to say that they would be the ones, two people who di are diametrically opposed, who don't even talk to each other anymore, still were the ones who were really integral to, you know, pushing along the, the narrative of the documentary and not a single person from the Stern show. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. I just was on Anthony yesterday and he's so good. And Opie's I've always been for, you know, it's like the rascals. I'm, I'm very good friends with Eddie and very good friends with Gene Cornish and good friends with Felix Cavalieri. Meanwhile, if you put those three guys in the same station wagon, they choke each other. <laughs> you know, uh, I just, I'm, I've always maintained, like if I'm friends with you and I'm friends with him and I'm friends with her, like if there's trouble between the two, God, if you if you only uh, are friends with people that don't have any, you know, what, like whatever each other. I do with you. Like if you haven't done anything to screw me around or been crappy to me, you're my friend. And if somebody else was crappy to you or you were crappy to them, that's none of my business. None usually, of my business. And it's usually so much horse crap anyway. The old, you know, there's the your version, her version, and the truth. You know, the old thing. So it's always somewhere it in between. Funny. It um, does throw people that. A few people have said that. Why? You got Opie and you got Anthony and you got nobody from Stern, which is kind of funny, you know. I think it's a weird thing, though, you know, because it's you being on the show is, is and I'm going to come back to the beginning of the documentary because a lot of things I want to talk about with your childhood. But, uh, you know, it's it's so part of Stern's legacy to have the people that are around him that formulated who he wound up being. Yet I feel like he has a genuine fear of giving credit to somebody else as being really funny on the show because in some way it diminishes his ability to be the funny guy, the top guy. I, yeah, you know, I, I've, 
I hesitate ever talking about that. You know, the, I know, but say, I... oh, here they say, oh, he's jealous. Of you. I'm like, jealous of me. You know, the guy's sitting on top of the world. Yeah, he you know? won. Uh, who's jealous, right? Yeah, but um, but there, I think there's an essence of truth in that. You know, and it's one of those things. If if me and him go into a room. He's not the funniest guy in the room. And it's that simple. And I know that sounds pompous, but it's not that pompous because, you know, that's just that's just how it works. And uh, but it was a great, great run. There's no real animosity. People want to make such a big deal about that. But I I asked the boss for more money and he said, that's too much money. And I went home. Of course, it became a lot bigger than that. And it was really crazy. And it was a lot of money. But in, you know, in looking back, it probably was the wisest decision in the world, you know, but, uh, but who'll ever know, you know, for all I know, I might've said, I signed a new contract. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to quit drinking. But I, Monique, after all those years, there's no way I would have, you know, so, but who knows, who knows? Do you think there's a weird correlation between so many comedians that either I talk to on this show or that I I'm friends with, um, quit drinking and they are as sober as can humanly be. And I, I feel like there's a, there's a range of people, let's say between the ages of say 45 and 75 who no longer drink. They don't smoke. They don't do anything. Do you think there was just a point where it just wore you down? It was, it was just time. I remember, uh, when I hadn't seen Richie Kanata in a long time and I heard, hey, Richie, I, I hear you're going out with the Beach Boys. And he goes, yeah. And it's a sober tour. You know, no booze, no pot, no coke, no nothing. And that was so long ago. I mean, just people, at some point, you just had to hang up your spikes, you know, like, you know, I mean, how many times can this happen? And to me, it wasn't, it wasn't that enough fun nights and enough craziness it was like, you know what? I've been so lucky so far that I haven't, I forget about killing myself that I haven't killed anybody else. Cause I would drive so far to gigs yeah. and do things. And, you know, everybody thinks they're such a good driver when they're drinking. And I just, you know, there would, you talk yourself into it for whatever reason, but you know, it's really funny. It's, it's like smoking. It used to be, if you walk down the, the street of Manhattan, everybody was smoking. Now nobody is smoking. You know, all of a sudden you think, oh, it's crazy to quit drinking. And somebody's like, so did I, so did I, so did I. But isn't it crazy, though, Jackie, that when you walk in the, I was, because I was in the city not too long ago, all I smell now is pot. You know, I, <laughs> I never stopped talking about it. I just did uh, the Jim Kerr morning show. Yeah. And I decided I was going to walk home to where I was staying from the from the morning show. It was about a half an hour walk in yeah. Manhattan at 730 in the morning. It's fantastic. Yeah. And in the old days, you smelled Greek food, and then you smelled pizza, and then you smelled Chinese food. And I especially remember when I was on Nutrisystem and not eating anything. It was like Starting. walking through a torture chamber, <laughs> but all these delightful smells. And now, it's it's not just, but it's every different kind of pot. Yes. Like every every step, and then you're like, "Where's that coming from?" And it's like a a seventy year old lady standing there smoking. Everywhere. Joy. And it's and there's so many places. Oh, you walk down 8th Avenue. There's the entirety of 8th between, like, say, 42nd Street and 14th Street. It's my friend, my friend, Ron Barber, that's in the film. I stay at his house sometimes. He's like 46 and 8th. He lives in a beautiful apartment. He's a rich guy, really great guy. And I hadn't been in the city in a while. I said, come on, let's go. And we went downstairs. And like you said, on 8th Avenue, like between 46 and 47th, there's like, Two or three, not in a row, but almost in a row. And you walk in and it's like walking into a Lego store or a Barbie <laughs> store, only it's all pot and every kinds of pot. And the guy by the counter recognized me. And how you doing? They had this big plasticine cube. And I said, holy, it was about half full. I said, wow. And he held it over and I took a smell. I thought it was going to knock me down. It was like sniffing ethyl alcohol. It's like, whoa, Jesus Christ. And it's just hard to believe, you know, I, by, <laughs> buying joints and, by, uh, you know, it, it's so out of control. You know, I, I grow pot. I'm like an antique, you know, yeah, exactly. I'm, like a, I'm like a little old man with a jalopy and these guys are selling jet planes, you know. It's <laughs> true. It's true. It's And, you know, edibles are more important than smoking right now. So the whole edible 
um, community. Like they can't get enough of the good stuff to drop it into like a gummy so that you can get complete. And, and it takes this much, this much to get as high as you probably would have like two or three. I, I, ha I still have not eaten a gummy or eaten a, uh, for 10 years, I had one of those Rice Krispie treats that had pot in it. I still have two, <laughs> two chocolate bars where you eat one little thing. Because in college, I was one of those idiots that said, let's make pot brownies. And we of put course. the pot in and made the brownies and ate one. I'm like, I'm not stoned and ate another one. I'm not stoned. So you eat three or four of them. And then an hour later, you're on Pluto because of course it takes time to go into your blood of system. Course. But you don't realize that when you're a stupid college kid. And then of course a couple months later, you do it again. I think I did it two or three times. And and you get so high it's like the kind it's like when you take fetal position. Like, it's a fetal will, position high. I will please God if you let me get through this, I swear to God right. I'll never do it again. Right. If you let if you let me come down, I'll never do it again. It's like we went up we went up in the woods when we were like seventh grade and there was this girl I really, really thought she was cute and I knew nothing. And I got on top of her and I dry humped her and dry humped her and dry humped her. And then walking home, I had never heard of it, but I got a case of blue balls that <laughs> I mean I couldn't move. I was uh I was out of my mind, and I swear it was the same thing. God, if you let me get through this, I will never misbehave again. And finally, of course, it weared off. And the next day, we're in the woods, and I dry humped her again. And then on the way off, my head again. And God was like, "Fuck you! I told you the first time." It's but like it's that, that stupid thing. joke. It's like that stupid joke where you know he's he's fucking the girl and. And, uh, you know, she's not even doing anything and she's really kind of like motionless and he's fucking and fucking. And he's like, he's like, what happened? You didn't come. I didn't hear your orgasm. And she's like, well, eh, you know, and he's like, yeah, but I saw your toes going like this. He's like, stupid. You, you didn't take my pantyhose off. <laughs> right, right. Just a classic. Just classic. I hate that you joke. Know. <laughs> the worst joke I ever heard is a guy that, uh, that's uh, uh, banging his 95 year old mother. And because uh, he has no money and he can't buy her birthday presents. So he figures, what the hell? Give her a shot. He'll, he'll give her a shot. And he's banging her. And all of a sudden he smells something horrible. And he looks and she had diarrhea all over the bed. And he's like, Ma, what is this? And she said, well, I'm, I'm too old to have an orgasm. And I wanted to do something to show you I was enjoying myself. <laughs> It's the dirtiest, but it's so funny. It's so See, funny. This is the delicious thing about your jokes. Like my friend uh, Xavier and I were talking about it yesterday because we both watched the documentary and, and just kind of were reviewing notes. And you know, we were talking about how comedians who are blue, you know, and and most comedians who are blue, they do jokes that are like, storytelling jokes so they're telling stories about themselves they're telling stories about things that happen in their lives or supposedly happen in their lives and that's the way they tell a story but yours are pure yours are just pure jokes and we were talking to about have a punchline so you can laugh and move on to the next thing move instead of it, on instead of it hanging like like a you know like a, a an, a, an elephant in the room you know like you're, a ball sack and you know we were talking about like dave Chappelle who will go on a tirade about like trans people and transphobia. And it's just a story that never ends. And it's really not that funny, but you <clears> could <throat> tell a joke about a gay guy or somebody. And it's like, boom, 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 done. Move on to something else. Well, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to open my mouth uh, to be mentioned in the same sentence as Dave Chappelle. I'm just going to say thank you and and not say a word but that is uh, just delightful. a different type of storytelling is what i'm you know, saying when i started on the stern show i don't know if people realize that was really my value and people that i i met x amount of people that said i knew howard the howard stern show in washington dc and then i knew the howard stern show in new york city and when you were on it yeah nbc and and K Rock and uh, and they said when Howard was in D.C. he was outrageous and funny, but when he got to New York, once you joined the show, he became funny and outrageous. If you if you're leaving with a laugh, he would get like you're talking about the Dave Chappelle thing. 
he'd go on and on about something horrible or get himself all boxed into something crazy. But then if I gave him a punchline, it would kind of pop the balloon and we could laugh and go to commercial and it was on to the next thing. And that it was very subtle, but it, you know, it, it, it made a difference, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, he, it was really fun, you know. He's not the comedian; he's more the P.T. Barnum. Like he's, I I think of him that way. He's the ringleader that gets <clears throat> everything kind of spurred, and and the best part, like you, like Artie said in the documentary, you know, you created that job, you created that that second guy in the room who could be funny and could spur things on, and. I feel like that's such a necessity to that type of show. Not maybe not today. You know, it's a different, it's a different well, world. It, and the difference being, <clears throat> I wasn't the second guy in the show doing anything. People had no idea. You know, like if you if you're talking to a friend and you're having a conversation, I'm in the room. I'm going to think of something funny every once in a while to say because I'm a funny guy. Only instead of saying it, I'm writing it down, and you're saying it. You're as funny as you. But you're also as funny as me, so you got such a leg up, you know. And it was, uh, it was a, it was a really fun, smooth, you know, wonderful operation. And it was, it, and it just got better and better and better. But I always, I always tell people, the only way it could have worked was with Howard. I never met anybody like like he could look at whatever I wrote and ingest it and spit it back so seamlessly that to this day, there's people that have no idea I ever wrote a note. He would look at it. He might turn it around and make it about Fred. He might make it about me or turn around, and make it on himself. If we were going so fast, he missed the line. He would go around the block and come back to get to the line. He just was so incredible. So it was, a, it was you know, like it or lump it. We were Abbott and Costello, but he, he doesn't like that. You know, he... Of course he doesn't you like know. that. You, you're actually more like Cyrano. Let's be honest. You Right, right. And That's who you are. I'm not. I'm not going to say anything about the fact that he had a big nose. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I've said that, I've said that the big nose that Cyrano had had nothing to do with the, nothing, with nothing at the, all, but everything. <laughs> I want to go. I want to go back to when you were a kid, and it was um, it was surprising to me to see that you were raised by all these like women in the house, and I can't even imagine having so many like almost like smother mothers who no 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 not <clears throat> not in the 50s in no way all it was was my mother and father we lived downstairs and my aunt and uncle shared the house it was my it was my aunt, uh, my uncle and my father's mother it was it was the house they grew up in yeah and by the you know the, the other brothers and sisters were older and married and moved out so when the boys came home from the war their father had passed away, so they moved into the house. And then my father got married, and then his brother married my mother's sister. You know, it's like, <laughs> hey, you're getting married. Does she got a sister? You know, and she did. We'll take and he her. Married her. <laughs> so, so they're upstairs, and we're downstairs. But I was the first kid, so I got my mother and father, and my aunt and my uncle. And there's there's one. This one kid, it's not like they even lived in the next town or the next block. They were upstairs. So, so they knows. shared you kind of. I mean, how did that formulate your your early years? I mean, I love it. I think it's amazing to have like that much family around. I, I tell people, there's, of course, there's no way to know anything about growing up. You know, did you have a happy childhood? You know, and the truth is. You can't compare to anybody. You can't compare to the kid next door. You no. don't know what went on behind closed doors. That's you right. can't compare it to your brother, or your sister, because two years later or four years later in a marriage, they're growing up in a completely different household. You know, I was with newlyweds and God knows if they even got along then. You know, I think my parents got married on the 4th of July and that's when the fireworks started. Okay. <laughs> And so I was born seven months later on, on Valentine's Day. But the way I describe it is I was the first kid to my mother and father and my father's brother, and my mother's sister. So for two years, I had four doting parents. And then after two years, my mother had a baby, another baby. My aunt had a baby. My father started drinking a lot more. And my aunt and uncle moved out. So I went from four kids. 
four parents to none. And I spent the next 70 years going, where the fuck did everybody go? Hey, I'm over here. Hey, now, I don't know if there's any truth to that, but it, it, it has to uh, formulate. It has to, it has to form your, your need for laughing and your need. It, for it had joking. to, but how did it, was it, you know, what's he going to do next? What's he going to do next? Or was it, Shut up, Jackie. Shut up. You know, you'll but we'll never know. Who knows? You're always maybe in the because maybe because you were, you know, you were like the only child for four parents, and then all of a sudden there's other kids and and not the four. It's the it's a little bit of the notice me thing. I feel like I feel like we all go through these waves in school where I was say I was, you know, funny got me through being in school. Because uh, I was a scrawny little shit kid, you know, funny got me through. Me too. I was tiny. I was tiny. You know, people say, well, you know, when was the, uh, when's the first time you did a joke in front of people or blah, blah, blah. You know, they ask all the same questions. And it, I, I don't know if this is in my book or whatever, but <clears throat> for whatever reason, they asked me to be the MC of the blue and gold dinner in sixth grade. It might've been fifth grade, but maybe sixth grade. The blue and gold dinner was a dinner that the Cub Scouts had each year. It was the Cub Scout and his father. Now, what the what the Cub Scouts did that didn't have a father, I have no idea. Because back then there was no divorces. Nobody's parents were dead. Everybody was young. Right. And they asked me to be MC. I, I distinctly remember my, asking my mother, what the hell does MC mean? And she explained, well, you're going to, you know, you're going to be in charge. The bottom line is only they wanted me to stand at the podium and lead lead the gang in the Pledge of Allegiance. That was my duties as MC. So there's a podium. And, you know, it's so funny. The memories you have of childhood, some of them are so distinct. The podium, I was a teeny kid. And the podium was up here. They actually had to find a box. I think it was a <laughs> box of beer bottles to put behind the podium so I could stand on the box so I could reach the microphone. To this day, if I stand at a podium, I'll go, hey, this is pretty cool. I don't have to stand on the box. A box. <laughs> I know that sounds stupid. So I'm supposed to be an MC. I Wait, know what does of... MC mean? I don't Master, even know. Master of ceremonies. Master of ceremonies, of course. Okay. So so I know nothing. I know I love jokes. That's all I know. And as a kid, if you were a Cub Scout, you automatically got a copy of this magazine, this monthly magazine called Boy's Life. Yes. And what's really fun is all these magazines are online now. Any all these old memories I have that people you always thought I was so full of crap. You can just every single thing I talk about my first projector and my first movies. Google they're it. all right. on the stupid web. So uh, it, this boy's life had a page like Playboy had a joke page. Yeah, they had a page called Think and Grin, and it was the worst jokes in the world. Stupid puns, very gentle, and there was this one joke. And I read it and I said, you know, I could tell that joke, but make it about Mr. Bot, who was the, the, the cup master. I didn't know from switching a joke or whatever. So I took this joke and I put his name in it. And not only did I do the joke with his name in it, it's the slightest bit off color. Not I'll tell you, but like it was, I'm telling you, the house came down. <laughs> I was I was up there and I said, thanks for coming tonight. I'm glad everybody's here. You know, it's so funny. Mr. Bot had a dream last night that he jumped out of an airplane wearing a parachute and he pulled the ripcord. And then when he woke up this morning, he got out of bed and his pajamas fell down. <laughs> <laughs> and they went nuts. And that's that's. Kind of a dick joke, not really. So but cute, kind of. though. So cute. Oh God! And and I, and that I, that laugh must have. You know, I don't remember. This. I I can remember being on the box, and I can remember what the, they looked like, and I just have to assume they laughed. But uh, I wasn't nervous. I just I just went for it. For, and, you know, nobody said, you know, Jackie, it'd be great if you said a little something. You know, there was they none might. of that. You know, go up and lead the Pledge of Allegiance. You know. Do you so have I a photographic that. memory? <clears throat> no, not yet. No, you mean uh, not when it comes to jokes or stuff like that. It's memory is very, very strange because we all know that it's all in there. We yeah. all know that. 
I remember, you know, like ten, uh, ten of us got together uh, a couple of days ago in Manhattan. Ten guys uh, and girls that were all, we all kind of started out at the same time at the comic strip in Manhattan. I was mm-hmm. only a part-timer, but all these people and my podcast partner, Peter Bales, had brought me in. And and Peter, you know, his peers were Jerry Seinfeld, Larry Miller, Paul Reiser, Carol Liefer, Dennis Wolfberg, Larry Miller, you know, the, the, the cream of cream of these guys. But these were all the, 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 the guys didn't, that didn't quite get the brass ring, but they were all so funny and so great. And we're sitting around, and I, we all remember so many stories in great detail from 1979 and 1980. And then the rest of the decade is like a blur. Because when you're just starting out and you're so frightened and it's such an unknown Everything, I guess, must stamp itself into your head because it's you know, illuminated because it's it's so new and it's so fresh. It's crazy. Like the seventies, I say about the seventies. I say I've I have no idea what happened in the seventies, but luckily nothing happened. You know, I mean, <laughs> who knew? You know, get, I still love all my fingers. Right, get drunk, happened. play guitar, do it again. Get drunk, play guitar, do it again. It was like you know. It was like uh, Groundhog Day, you know. I will tell you, though, you know, like, you know, obviously I'm friends with Grillo, as you are. And um, and what he always used to say about you before I met you was, um, I don't understand how Jackie always does like these, you know, quick hit jokes because his stories are almost almost as good, if not sometimes better than his jokes. But and you've never been a long form kind of storyteller. <clears throat> how come? Because to me, if I tell a joke and they always get laughs, but if I told a joke and it didn't get laugh, what do I care? I, I think my stories are just so personal to me that it probably would break my heart if people didn't laugh at them. And I knew that at some point they would bubble out. Uh, but long, long-term long stories, especially when I start telling a story, I always think of something else and, and I always wind up adding too much in. And I wouldn't want to shave off my stories. So, you know, so that's why I write my autobiography was so, so much fun. I mean, I literally have a second autobiography in my computer because I wrote twice as much as I needed. And I got five more books in me. And I, you know, once in a while I branch off on stage and I'll go into a story and somebody will come up and say, Hey, that was better than the jokes. I'm like, hey, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I could believe that to be true. I mean, you, yes. So you did bow to Stern. Um, was no, and I did, I did do, I did do that. I did a one man show at Iridium for two months, uh, however long ago. And it was the greatest show. The guys at Iridium was funny as well. I, I don't know if it's still uh, Alan Stern, who has the diner above Stardust Diner. Ellen Stardust uh, Diner. At, at 50, yeah, 51st I know, really. I'm Broadway. sure, 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 sure. You know, the tables, you know, she was Miss Subway in 1958. And that's all, <laughs> you know, she was just a character. <laughs> so her two sons, Ronnie and and uh, and Ken, like all ran Iridium. But Ken was in Vermont and he was a big fan. And he really loved me and wanted me to do something there. But it was a jazz club and Ronnie right. really wasn't into it. So for two months... I tried to do a show there and they didn't do anything to promote it. And it, you know, it just broke my heart, but it was a great show. I had two musicians that I met from the Les Paul show. Mm-hmm. They were in Les Paul's band, the greatest players, uh, two guys in a bass. In fact, you know, uh, Frank and Vinny and Gary, and they would open the show with 15 minutes of unbelievable music. And I actually had, two microphones. No, I had three microphones. So I came out after they had played a while and pick up the guitar and I would sing a song with them. The reason I knew them so well is we had made my music album together. So we play one of my songs and then I walk up to the joke mic and tell dirty jokes. And then as I walked over to the story mic, they would start playing background music and I would tell stories while they're playing background music. And then I'd come back to them and do another one of my songs. And I made that trip about three times and then had a guest. And, it, and I'm telling you, Monique, it was a, incredible. The first week, my guest was Billy West. And the next week, it was the real Kramer. And I would love it, to see that, honestly. It, it was so much fun. But, you know, like opening night, we had 80 people. And the next week, we had 70 people. And the next week, we had... It was August. It was August. And yeah, nobody's in New York. So, yeah. you know, and, and on a Monday night, of course, you yeah. know, so... But it was great fun. And I did I enjoy telling those stories? 
especially with them, you know, they're playing like music from the 40s. And I'm telling the story about growing up with four parents, you know, it, it was heavenly, you know. So, so now maybe with the we'll documentary, do it now with the documentary, though, I think you've you've kind of come like full circle with being able to tell these stories like, you you know, you've told great stories. The my favorite my favorite parts of the documentary for sure have to be with the Rodney Dangerfield thing, because, you know, you look at Rodney as like this icon of comedy and. I was a, a very young girl when, you know, Dangerfields was a thing. I always remember passing it on the east side. And, you know, you'd always think to yourself, I wonder if I'll ever see Rodney. I wonder if I'll ever see him. And, you know, I, I kind of grew up with thinking that he was just a cranky, cantankerous old man and, and never the one that you <clears throat> probably knew. Well, he was, <clears throat> but, but he was Is that him behind you, by the way? Uh, yeah, somebody gave me that years ago, and I, I love it. Love okay, it. I, I like having on my shoulder like the like the devil. I know? love it. And I it, love it. And, and I got nobody on the other shoulder telling me to clean it up, you know. But uh, I'll make you a Howard hate, bobblehead on the other side. <laughs> I, yeah, I hate what happened on the Stern Show because what happened with me and Rodney on the Stern Show was such horseshit, and they made such a craziness out of it. And of course, he went along with it a little bit. What like happened? Whole, I don't know the story. Well, it, the, the whole thing is in my book, and it's the greatest story in my book. And it, it's the whole thing that leads up to the whole thing about the, the, the great story that's in the documentary. But it's too long to go into. But the bottom line was, and it's so funny because somebody gave me this stupid thing, and it's got so many jokes on it. And once in a while, somebody will push the button, I'll hear a joke. Wait, that Rodney concept, thing you're talking about? Yeah, and the whole concept of what happened with me and him, I sold him four jokes and I sold him his favorite joke of all time, which he which always said, oh, that was the greatest joke. You know, how could I ever get mad, you know? And then at a certain point, I had uh, been sending him jokes and sending him jokes and he took like, I think two, you know? And you send him so many, but he just was so picky. And then all of a sudden, he did a joke on Carson that I had sent him or he did it, to, you know, here and there. And the reason I'm saying this is the other day, maybe a year ago, somebody pressed the button and I heard the dummy <laughs> back here tell a joke that I had sent him that he had never paid for. He said, Damn, that documents my story. So I went into Dangerfields <laughs> and went to the dressing room. And I said, Rodney, and it wasn't that he was trying to rip anybody off. He was doing coke and getting stoned and he of was course. so drunk. He was not a bookkeeper. He was a very funny, crazy gentleman. And I said, listen, there's, there's jokes popping up that, that you never bought. He said, well, well, who cares? You know, and I had borrowed $1,000 from him to rep reprint my first album. And, uh, and I said, listen, you know, I, I don't care, but it's, it's just a little weird. He says, well, all right, let's say, let's say maybe 10 jokes. I use 10 jokes. So that's well, 500 bucks. I, I owe you, you owe me 500 bucks. So give me 10 more jokes. We'll call it square. <laughs> Which that, but the idea of jokes for payback, the $50, that's what he paid. The first time he bought jokes for me, it was $50 a joke. Made total sense. So, of course, I never got anything through to him again, but it didn't matter. You know, you're starting out, you're scratching and clawing. And then a couple of years later, I wrote to him and said, Rodney, I'm still so goddamn broke and I, I got a new album I want to put out. Can you lend me $2,000? But I never heard from him, okay? Which is fair. That's absolutely fair. By the time he left the Stern show that day, Howard had me owing him three thousand oh, dollars. Are you this, kidding me? And to no, to this day, people email me. When are you going to pay back Jack? Uh, when are you going to pay back Rodney? You cheap are you bastard? kidding me? <clears throat> but so funny is the whole concept of the the exchange of jokes for you know fifty dollars a joke. That was a known thing. Every comic in Manhattan sold them a joke here and there. And when he said, yeah, well, just give me 10 more jokes, we'll be square. You know, that's how he talked, we'll be square. <laughs> when, when I said that, he said on the show, I don't know anything about paying with jokes. And that's all he had to say. Ah, jeez. <clears throat> he threw me under the bus. And Monique, I love him to this day and had so much fun with him. And the last thing I was going to do was throw Rodney Dangerfield under the bus and say, listen, boss. You were so full of coke and pot and booze. You had no idea what end was up back then. You know, I'm not making it up. And 
I just shut up and I just I just took it on the chin. But I didn't know it was going to go on for 20 years. Yeah, no but, shit. But but that's what it was, you know. And uh, but it, it, who cares? It became legend. But I'll tell you right now, I'm sure I'm sure I'm going to see a text from somebody saying, I can't believe you're still sticking to that story <laughs> about the jokes. And it, which is, you know, but meanwhile, if you saw the documentary, you saw two hundred dollars for jokes. I mean, you know, the, the, it's right there. You know. See, that's the thing about you. You, you're kind of, you know, I've seen that room. I've seen that history of you're. You're kind of like a joke hoarder. You're like a paper hoarder when it comes to your stuff. There, nobody can deny that you did this because you always bring the receipts. Like I, I can doc, you know, I can document everything. And now the fact that everything is in the Google really makes it fun. You know, I got a great friend who built, literally built, like designed and built the float, my float, yeah. which Robin called the jetty, <clears throat> which is so funny because everyone knows black people can't swim. Right. <laughs> and she referred to my float as a jetty. Now, a jetty is a bunch of rocks going out into the water. Exactly. But she referred, so every time Robin called it a jetty, it was a black joke, which is just so funny. <clears throat> and... It's a the guy who duck. built the, the guy who built the float was Bruce Springsteen's first manager. So when I said that, everybody's like, "You were so full of crap, Mike Appel." <laughs> Mike Appel was Springsteen's manager. You make all these stories. Everybody always thought I was making up. As Google filled in and filled in more and more information. Now, if you go on Google, you'll see Carl Tinker West and how he. They said they have the dates when Springsteen's band played in his garage because Springsteen slept in Carl Tinker West's garage and he took them to uh, meet Bill Graham in San Francisco and he told Bruce not to sign with him or else he'd get stuck there. And then he passed Springsteen to Mike Appel. And all of a sudden there it is, you know, and and he built the jetty. But in I mean, what world? Crazy is that? What, crazy in what is that? world would you make that up? Like, there's no correlation to anything in the world to make I that up. Be, I am not that. I am not that creative. But let me see. I got a quote. <laughs> you know, I'm not even a big Springsteen. I like Bruce Springsteen. Me but I'm not either. One of those nuts. You know, like. But let's Google I'm, first agents for random rock stars and see who we come up with. Oh, uh, it's just. And at the same day, he delivered this huge pot that cooks 200 lobsters at the same time that he designed <laughs> that had propane the guy's a nut and he's one and I, i'm sure that's in the in the jetty in the documentary too you know, i will so, tell and, you i will tell you we just did a show like two weeks ago um where where listeners wanted to know their, their favorite their favorite eras of the stern show and their favorite things and without hesitation um the Jetty stories, the Cardoza Hotel, and the Jackie Puppet are, are quite possibly the three things that come up the most frequently other than like Artie laughing. Like, cause when Artie would start to laugh at just, it was so infectious like yours is. And, and these are the moments that people remember. I mean, uh, very few things are like Howard related. Most of the funny, truly funny <coughs> stories are, are you. But his manipulations are everything. That Cardozo yes. Hotel, I've never, <laughs> I've never got that. That suite where Nancy and I stayed belonged to. Now I'm going to forget her name. The the huge star, the the Latin American star. Um, ah, she's bigger than life. Whatever her name is, her Gloria Estefan. Gloria Estefan. Her and her husband own, maybe still do, but own the Cardozo Hotel. <laughs> and I went and worked, you know, in Florida and Chicago and Denver. I, I was the guy, like Fred didn't go anywhere. Gary might go, you know, to Connecticut to do an appeal. Hey, how is up Gary? And that's as far right. as he Open got, up a know. Chevy station or something. <clears throat> right, right. But I'm going and doing my jokes and appearing on the radio station. And they could take me to clubs and, and strip shows and then and make, because they can put me loose in any group and have fun. Yeah. <clears throat> so I worked in Florida. And I always made fun with, uh, had great times with the general managers and the sales reps, and because I'm a nice guy, and and we were they were making a lot of money, I was making a lot of money because it was a win-win, you know, because the stations were all doing great, right? And so I was good friends with the guy Dave. Uh, I used to know his last name, but who I, I think he actually owned the station, but at least he was the general manager. 
And me and Nancy would never book anything in advance I, because it's Christmas coming. And all of a sudden, it's here it is, Christmas is coming and we don't have any. And there's no way to get a reservation. And I called Dave, my friend. You know, that's the thing that people completely omit. You don't call a stranger asking for a favor. This is a guy, he's already a friend, you know. After I spend a night with somebody, they're usually my friend. Believe it, that's hard to conceive for some people. Uh, no names here. And I call, I said, Dave, we're on vacation next week. And uh, it might have been two weeks in advance. I said, but we cannot find a place. That, can you help me? And he said, you know, Gloria Estefan's a good friend. And her and her husband are going to be out of town. I'm sure they would, would rent you their suite uh, for a week. I said, great. Okay. Now, I don't know whether he said, I'll get a good rate for you or whether I said, whatever. Oh, but it doesn't matter. You were going to so pay we went, well, we went, either way. We went there and we spent the week and it was great. And of course we paid for it. So we come back and all of a sudden, Howard's got this piece of meat. Jackie leaned on the on the manager of, of the affiliate of Howard Station. Right. Of Howard's show. Using my name. On the guy. Use my name to squeeze a free room, and he went a whole diatribe for 10, 15, however long. And he finally gets to the end. I said, are you through? Because if you're through, I would like to throw in that Nancy and I paid for that room. That is not, if you listen to that show, that is not on there. By the really? way, we paid for it. That's not on there. So, you know, you cheap bastard. Why didn't you pay for the room? You know. Why didn't you pay Rodney? I mean, it's all part of lore now, but you know, it, it defines you. I mean, <laughs> my, in my a friends, stupid way. But your friends know friends, you're not that guy. For years, my friends were like, "What's this whole thing about you being cheap? You like, you couldn't be more generous, especially now that you got some money." I said, "Howard knows it makes me nuts. Of course, he knows that that's a big button, <clears throat> and it works every time. Like I have a party." and serve 200 lobsters to the entire Stern crew. And then somebody will say, you know, Jackie didn't have enough butter. And on Monday, I would say, yeah, Jackie had everybody for lobster, but he didn't have enough butter. And Robin cheap would say, bastard. Yeah, <laughs> that cheap mother, you know. And then it, that's, you know. And as absurd as, you see how absurd that is, but the listeners don't. All they hear is, Jackie's cheap. Jack is cheap. They don't we just didn't talk. know. Lobsters, you know what? Yeah. Honestly, we just didn't know. We, you know, we we drank the Kool Aid just like anybody else did. And, and so, the, the way the show perceived you, or or how you came off, or how Robin came off, this is what we knew. This is all we and knew. And I I didn't care. It of worked. course, we it worked. It the only thing that wasn't working was share the wealth. We're all in this thing. I don't care if you beat me over the head with a chair. But pay me for it. You know, that's all. And that yeah. that's that was the rub. It wasn't like, don't pick on me, don't make fun of me, don't people I'm you know, the, you know, Curly would never say, Listen, uh, I'm gonna resign, but I don't want Mo to poke me in the eye anymore. That, where's the show? Then there's no show, you know. But what, so. wasn't your wasn't your uh agent also Don Buckwald? No. Oh, but no, theirs that, was. But theirs no, was, right? That, Robin and Fred's. That was the rub. From day one. Yeah, I'm sure. When I joined Mornings, <clears throat> Howard said, hey, I got great news for you. Uh, Don is going to, Don Buckwald is going to represent you. And I said, no, I don't think so. Because, and which was a pretty tough thing to stand up and say no. Yeah. Because he's got Howard and Robin and Fred and then me. So he's going to give Howard almost all the money. Some of it that's left, he's going to give to Robin. If there's any left after that, he's going to give it to Fred. And I'm going to get what's left after that. There, there, there were no rules yes. ever for no negotiation or anything like that. I said, no, you know, I didn't want that. And I paid for it for 15 years. You know, yes, I was, you did. I, I'm shocked that that would even be an issue. Who would do that? Like in what crazy world? My, my cousin Craig, I don't I never looked to see if it's true, but he told me a baseball agent, can't have more than one player on the same team. Now, yes, maybe I was, was going to mention 30, that. That is absolutely 30 years true. Ago. Yes, because you know, yes, you can have you can have uh, Harry on first base, base, but you got to take Charlie on third base, who's nowhere near as good. But you got to take them both. And, you and know, here comes the pitcher. So yeah. you know, who's there was, there, get was, the most there, there was booking organizations in the, in the early eighties. I forget the name of it, but uh, and Leno was signed with him and said, "Yeah, you can. We'll 
we'll book Leno at your club, but you got to take this guy and this guy for right. a week each, you know, <clears throat> and that's, I mean, that showbiz, that's life, you know, but I would, I was smart enough to not do that, but I always paid for that. And, you know, the stories that go on and on are mostly boring to people because to most people, Jackie, shut up. You're so lucky to be in that room. We would give anything just to sit in that room. That, but that's not how, that's like Mickey Mantle. You should play for free. All you're doing is playing a game. We'd love to play on the Yankees. That's not how it works, you know. That's not how it works. But, when, but what are you going to do? What are you going to do? When you started at NBC, how long had Howard been on the air there? <clears throat> um, I, I think about three months. So was Robin um, there yet? Because there no, were some contract no. negotiations and all that was stuff. A, I wasn't privy because I wasn't there yet. I only learned back time. But when Howard got hired from from Detroit to go to Washington, right? Fred Norris had been sending him bits and telling, you know, and doing bits over the phone with him. From he was still in Connecticut. And Howard said, all right, I'll come to D.C., but you got to take my friend Fred, Fred Norris with me. So Howard and Fred went to D.C. And then famously, Denise Oliver introduced Robin to, to Howard, and she became part of the show. But when NBC hired Howard, they didn't hire Robin. They hired Howard and Fred. And I wasn't around, but supposedly it, it was very nasty. And Howard was, I guess, said, listen, let me go up there and get my foot in the door and then and I'll then bring, I'll bring you, you up, you know, but uh, I don't know what went down, but and, she and, signed a know. contract with DC one Oh one. They were paying her an extraordinary amount of money at the time. She asked for like a hundred thousand dollars and they said sold. And, uh, but then she started, you know, she started calling in sick and not going in and they were like, you know, what's going on? I thought we had a deal. In reality, she was just waiting for Howard to come and so, grab her. I don't even know that. I wasn't even privy to that. But I yeah. know there was some craziness that went back and forth. And finally, she was brought up there. But just as he was making the move, just as he got fired at DC 101, the club owner, Harry Montecrusos from Garvin's Laugh-In, it was a comedy club that I used to go down and work. My dog. Okay. I was going to say, I hope it's not in my house. So... <laughs> Not that I don't like dogs. I don't want to get eaten while I'm talking to you. So, um, so he likes me. I can tell he likes me. So you uh, be quiet. Hold, hold Harry, on. Stay with me. Stay with me. I'm here. Okay. So, so Harry said there's this nut that used to do broadcasts in his underwear from the club on Friday mornings. He just got fired from DC 101 for this outrageous stunt. But he's got, got hired to go to WNBC in New York. You really should look him up. <clears throat> At the time, uh, me and Nancy already had three comedy albums that we were sending to everybody. If I ran into a cab driver who I say, I think I saw you at a comedy club. What's your name? What's your address? And we sent him all three albums, all three matching cassettes, promo. I'm telling you, we set out, set out between three and four hundred sets of all the albums, all the all the cassettes. This is postage and albums and work and stuffing envelopes. And we didn't have, we didn't have money. We had a little bit of money <clears throat> because of governor's comedy shop. We're, we're doing the shows there, but we were working our ass off, but we're putting everything back in with no idea what we're doing. And Harry said, look this guy up. So I just wrote Howard Stern, care of 30 Rockefeller Plaza, WNBC AM. I never heard of the guy. I didn't listen to radio unless I was listening to oldies on CBS FM. Right. I mainly, I played cassettes of my stupid jokes so I could learn them or I'd play, you know, the Eagles or Jimmy Buffett or something. And so it was just one of those sets of albums that we sent out, never knowing what's going to happen. And then like a couple months after that, I, I guess that was at the end of August, but it wasn't until like February that uh, Nancy called me. I was in my mother's attic still. That's where Jokeland was. <laughs> Just she, <laughs> and she, yeah. that would roll a dial a joke. If you saw that picture of the dial joke machines, that was my mother's attic where I, I love up. that. I love that. I want to come back to that. Yeah. And um, she said, that guy, Howard Stern called. He wants you to, he wants you to call him. I called up. He got right on the phone. He said, listen, we listen to your albums and we, you know, every joke, we think you're right. Do you want to come in and sit in today? We're going to do a, 
a talent contest over the telephone. And meanwhile, I'm, I'm hosting Governor's Comedy Shop in Levittown. So Rockefeller Plaza sounded pretty good, you know. But pretty so far. I, I went in <clears throat> and sat down and there was Howard and Robin and Fred. The same, the same four people that were there the last day I was there in March 2001. The same four people. And I walked in and we laughed for, I think I got, came in for the starting uh, about the beginning of the second hour. And we laughed our asses off for three hours. And at the end of the show, he said, you know what? You're a lot of fun. Why don't you come back next week? And as they say, you know. And then when did you become full-time? Like how long did you do the week thing? He got, uh, I did, I was there once a week for free for three years for free. The whole thing was Nancy said, listen, it'd be really nice if you pay Jackie's parking. So he was supposed to give me $25 a week for parking. I'd forget, he'd forget, or he'd say, I only got a 20. We had just take 20. It was, it, it was a running gag, you know. You would and, literally uh, get played in plugs? Like, seriously? Yeah, yeah. well, of course. You know, that. I, and it's, it's really amazing. I, I figured out to parlay it. Three but uh, I'd call, he'd say, maybe you should bring your comic friend. And I'd call friends. Like a bunch of guys I was with the other day. I'd say, hey, you want to come on the Howard Stern show with me on a Tuesday? And they'd say, what's it pay? Yeah. And I said, what do you mean, what's it pay? You're going to be on the radio, 50,000 watts in the tri-state area. You cannot buy that kind of exposure. And, and you know, and to this day, I had still there's still guys that come up to me and say, I can't believe I didn't go on the Stern show with you, you know, because it just would be such a great story. And um, and then I got the bright idea. I said to Mark from Rascals, Mark Magnuson, the known Rascals Comedy Club, I said, listen, I'm on the Stern Show on Tuesdays, and I know you're a big fan of the show. Why don't you have your open mic night on Tuesdays and let me host it? Then I can plug it, and you can pay me a couple hundred bucks. Because even if we don't get any people there, it's worth 200 bucks to you get mentioned on the Howard Stern Show. So I started plugging Rascals and hosting the, the Comedy Hour. And uh, I don't know if, who, if you know who Reverend Bob Levy is, but he was of course what one, one of the one of the auditioners was this guy that was so filthy. By the end of the second time he was on, the next time he came on, I introduced him as Reverend Bob Levy just because he was so goddamn filthy. And then twenty years later, somebody says, "Ah, oh, I'm working with Reverend Bob Levy." I couldn't believe the name stuck like that. So, and I'd get plugs, Jack. He's at Governor's Comedy Shop and blah blah blah. One really funny thing is. He plugged 5169221. And he plugged the next week, he plugged 5169221. And then I got a phone call in the middle of the week. And he said, Jackie, I got some bad news. I was like, well, you know, I had a couple of weeks on New York City radio and it was great. What, what can you do? And he said, I can't plug 9221 anymore because we got complaints because the jokes are dirty. So I can't, can't say that anymore. And I was like, Fuck nine two two wine. Is that all? Jesus Christ! And then all of a sudden, that was gone. And I used to be Jackie nine two two wine Martling. And then within weeks, Rick Dees named me the Joke Man. So I went from Jackie nine two two wine Martling to Jackie the Joke Man Martling, and we we're off to the races. And uh, I got to stay, and it was like that. It, it I just... love it. Um, we have a little special guest I wanted to bring on because he and I were having a little conversation yesterday, and I'm like, oh my god, did you watch? Uh, Jackie's documentary and of course he's in it so he's like what'd you think of it I'm like well what'd you think of it I said I thought it was amazing he's like I, well he'll tell you himself hold on a second let me bring him in here it's oh, number you. number four on iTunes it's incredible absolutely incredible Jackie how you doing brother thank you yeah we're kicking ass we might even just be in being on top of Yogi is a little special anyway but that's fantastic you know I love now, it it's I'm I, so and I love all the support I'm getting from all you guys. You, but you know that. You know that. Yeah. Well, we we love you, and I, I uh, you it. were a, a major part of that brand and building that <clears throat> entire ecosystem. And uh, I'm just glad that uh, you're you're doing well, and and the uh, documentary is going to. I hope it goes to number one, and I think it will. Is that good? And uh, I love telling people about it, and everybody that I know that has seen it has just raved about it. So so God bless you, man. I wish you all the success. <laughs> You know, and I'm so glad people like it because <clears throat> any movie you're in, even if you're in a movie for one, three scenes, 
it's just hard. It's just weird to watch yourself. So to have a goddamn documentary about you, like like uh, the screening, you know, yeah. it, you're sitting there and like, you're like, hey, look at me, look at me. And there's, but here's all the people that are in it, you know, your own family, but they're all laughing and having a great time. It's a, it's a little bit surreal, you know, but, but yeah. in a good way, you know, in a great way. And, but and even the, the dogs way- like it. Yeah, exactly. It, and the way that Ian Carr put it together was just absolutely brilliant, uh, the way he told the story. And what a tribute to you. I mean, it is just really, really well done. And I wish you all the success. I got to jump here. I got a two o'clock, but I love you, Jackie. And thank you so much, Monique, for having me on. And I wish you well, Let me but- say one thing, Monique. Every time I see Tim, he always has to jump. He's never had a meeting. He's not. <laughs> I agree. He's like, he's I- like, he's like He's Steve Martin on the Tonight Show saying, Johnny, I got to jump. And then he goes back in. I didn't really have to go anywhere. <laughs> no, I, I, like, I like Gordon Ramsay on the run. <laughs> there you go. That, Tim, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. I love you, you guys. You. Goodbye, Tim. Unbelievable. He, he's the worst. He is the worst. And he always takes time for your phone call, but he always has to jump. Yeah, I, don't even get me going with him, but I love him. You know, once you know... Once you know once you know somebody's meat and potatoes, you know, like it's like if you have a friend that's incredibly cheap, but he stays your friend, you're out of your mind if you get upset every time he's cheap. You already you can't took be upset. That you know the animal. I mean, right. that, 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 that's all there is to it. You know the territory. You got to know the territory. <laughs> so I have questions. So I have a couple of them that I didn't get to. And I want to. Uh, <laughs> So it's funny. Somebody on my website made this comment, which I think is is really prescient. It said, there is an entire cottage industry of people watching anything and anyone that used to be connected to the Howard Stern show. And yet the one place you can't go to get that fix is the Howard Stern show, which I find amazing and true. And do you ever, um, like, I'm sure you don't listen to the Stern Show. I'm sure you don't <coughs> listen to Sirius or anything like that. I'm just curious if they I, ever put I on reruns. Listened, I never listened to the show. I never listened to the show when I was on it. I never listened to the show um, when we're on vacation. When I, The greatest story, my favorite story, is I did listen to the show in the very beginning because I didn't know who he was. I didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> and uh, so on a I would listen to the show if I happened to be somewhere where there's a radio because I was starting to write him ideas. He had, he did a thing. He did a a, a black helicopter traffic reporter, Mama Look a Boo Boo Day. Sure. So I'd write this this you know this obscene uh, uh, black helicopter reporter stuff, or I do this and and <clears throat> and when I first handed it to him, he kind of looked at me like I was crazy. But then I'd listen to a little of the show and I'd hear him using it. The next time I'd be like, "You want some more? Like, yeah, give me you know." Yeah, of course. <clears throat> and I can still remember so clearly. And, you know, <clears throat> I think somebody found this piece of tape and I listened to it. And what I'm going to tell you isn't on there. But I know I the same thing as Carl West and Bruce Springsteen. Why would I just make this up? You know, right. <laughs> <clears throat> and the reason I remember so well is because I was on a step stool in the kitchen of Nancy of the house Nancy and I were renting. And the reason I remembered is because I never fixed anything. <clears throat> and I was on a step stool fixing something, which was like catching a hummingbird with his wings not moving. It was unbelievable. <laughs> and all of a sudden he says, Robin, we, uh, Gary said, I don't, I don't think it was even Gary. It might've been. No, I don't think I was still. There yeah. And he came and said, Howard, there's a girl here who wants to get naked for you. And he's like, really? And, bring her in. And as best I can remember, she, I guess she came in with a, like a full length fur coat on. And I don't know whether she took it off first, but she sat down and Howard said, uh, thanks for coming in. Thank you. And who are you? And I always go to say Maria Melito, and that wasn't her last name, but it was very much like that. It was in a t- Maria something. She said, my name is Maria such and such. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm trying to do stand up. I work the door at the Comedy Factory outlet, and my favorite comedian is Jackie Martling. And I almost fell off the goddamn step stool, and I <laughs> swear to you on my life, and I've never been able to find that clip. 
And the craziest thing of all is there was a guy that just attacked Howard relentlessly, I think on into after he was at K-Rock and he wrote for the, I think the Philadelphia Daily News or the Inquirer, one of them, and he just nipped at Howard's heels constantly. <clears throat> and he wound up married to the girl that got naked on the Stern Show. No. His name is Stu Bykovsky, B-Y-K-O-F-S-K-Y. I think they're long divorced. But Stu Bykovsky married Maria. And I'm like, who could make that up? In How what you... world? Right. <laughs> In what world? And he wasn't horrible. He just was like he, one of those, you know, he just nipped at Howard's heels. And, and like any, you know, any journalist, they know they're going to get mentioned. You know what I mean? That, that you know. Of so. So wait, very I have a question. Funny, very funny. So, you know, Artie was talking about how when he was going through his problems and he had issues, you were the only one who texted him, reached out to him and said, you know, probably one of the only people in the world who knows what you're going through right now. And and of course, of course, that's who you are, because, of course, you would do that and you understand the animal and you, you saw what he was going through. And um, and I think that was really, really big of you considering you know it had been a while since you had been on the show you, you saw what somebody like an arty was going through and and you were there and by the way arty looked amazing in this documentary it's it's like the brightest i've seen his eyes in in a long time that that itself is a great story but uh <clears throat> truth be told you know it it wasn't incredibly magnanimous because he's a nice guy and he had always been my friend. And I sent him a supportive text. It wasn't like I bought him a Cadillac. Yeah, right. I'm, <laughs> I'm so glad it hit him, that, not hit him hard, but. He did, that it was, though. That it, it, it did. It was them. meaningful. Because some people that are in that situation be like, oh, go to hell. You know what I mean? Like, because it, it, it's a weird head. <clears throat> but he wanted to be in the documentary. And it was so hard to hook up. It took a year to track down. Oh, Willie 17 Nelson. different phone numbers. It changes every, like, two weeks. Willie Nelson wanted to be in the documentary, but just trying to find a place where we could get blah, blah, blah. We finally had to fly to uh, New Orleans and go to the uh, the, heart, the House of Blues, and we got in Willie's bus outside of the House of Blues. And that itself is a whole amazing, fun story. You know, and after we interviewed him, we got stoned with him. <clears throat> I'd love to see that whole know. interview, by the way. I, would, I hate that oh, it's just, I, like, bits I, and pieces. I would have liked to see more of that. Uh, I I have that, and I have the exact same thing from a year before when I got on the bus, and Willie's daughter Amy shot me and Willie for twelve minutes, and that's amazing. I mean, I'll be glad. I'm surprised I never sent it to you, but um, yeah, I'm surprised so you never we, sent it to me either. I I love shit like that, and I, I love I, to see you it's, interacting it's, that way. It's so fun. So uh, Artie wants to be on in the documentary. It was so hard to hook up with him. And then he, he got in trouble and went to jail and went to the hospital and went to rehab. But the documentary took so long to put together that Artie got out of rehab, got cleaned up, and he's in great shape. So Ian went and interviewed him. And he's one of the best things in the documentary. And it's, it's you know, it's like a good things come to people who wait or something like that. But uh, yeah, and I, 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 I feel so like I appreciate it. it you know? And I appreciate both of you understanding the animal that was the Stern show, because in both cases, neither of you and he, you know, particularly have not gotten the support of the Stern show going forward. Like there's no there's no um, Rachmunis, if you will, of the uh of, of the ability to to really relate to anybody who's ever been on the show anymore. Because well, it'd be a lot easier a lot easier to do this interview if you didn't talk Jew. <laughs> I, know I, don't know I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I have Rock Moonis or not because I'm not sure if it's good or bad. I know I've had Rock Moonis before, but I think I got rid of it. It's good. It's like a good feeling. It's like a doing something for somebody else, washing somebody it's else's a, back. It's what a mensch would do. It's like right? a mensch. I, I, wait, I have random questions and I need to get to them. One, um, one of your most famous uh, jokes is always give Rodney a chance. Did you use Rodney because of Rodney Dangerfield? Had nothing to do with it. Nothing Damn it. to do with it. And it. whoever told me that joke or whether it, wherever I found that joke, the word Rodney was in it. And I just thought it was so weird <clears throat> because there was so it's 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 a 
joke about a black guy. I, there aren't. I've never met a black guy named. I Rodney. have only it's met black men named Rodney. <laughs> only. Well, I've only known and, black and, and, Rodneys. And just the name Rodney itself is so funny. Now Delicious. I don't know whether it's funny. I always thought it was a funny name before Rodney Dangerfield. It's just like, it's just odd. You know, it's it's you know. <laughs> it is a odd name. Damn it! I was wishing hoping. Okay, so after NBC and before you guys got to K Rock. Um, you know, Howard, just to kind of fill the time and to <clears throat> keep in touch with the audience, started doing like some live shows. Did you participate in those? And how was that? They were strip shows. We did oh. male, <clears throat> male strip shows. His book, <clears throat> I think it's the first book, either the first or second book. There's a picture of me bent over, spreading the cheeks of my butt. That was my bare ass on the stage at Club Benet. We did it at, I think, Webster Hall or Irving, one of those places. And we did it at um, Club Benet. And it was so horrible. It was Howard and me and Gary and Fred. And I don't, I, I, there was no stuttering John yet. It was, it was the four of us. And I'm not sure if there was anybody else. And then, because uh, Ralph wasn't even around yet. The way Ralph found his way to us is, uh, well, Ralph we was 17 or 18 years old, which is so weird to me, but okay. We did the New Year's Eve show, <clears throat> and and he came to Howard. He had a prop. He had like a seven-foot penis, like a stuffed <laughs> penis. And so Howard let him be on the show. Yet we never figured that out. And you know, he became his stylist. He used, to, he used to give everybody such a hard time about, Gary, you're still friends with the idiots you met in high school. And, Oh, Jack, you still you're with those losers, Burf, and those guys from Oyster Bay and Babel. Why don't you get some real friends, you know? And then he meets a kid that worked in a gas station. A kid. That approached him at random, and a that kid. became his friend, which is totally fine. And so his like stylist. All the, all the things he's doing are fine. Just don't tell everybody, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and then doing them all. If you go down the back of Howard's book in private parts, there's a a checklist of about seven things. If you want to be happy, don't do any of these. And he did every one of them, which is you fine. Know, Just don't people don't tell people not to. That's all. I guess. And the funny thing to me is that at your house, which is absolutely beautiful, but I don't think people really appreciate how lovely and gorgeous your place is on the sound. And you have Thanks. one room that is dedicated to Grey Gardens in its own bizarre way, which I love. I love the Meisel brothers. I love that. I love that documentary. I love everything about it. And it's funny to me because on our show, we constantly say that Howard will become like Big Edie, like Howard will become that person, you know, stuck in his house. He still has a fear <clears throat> of COVID. He doesn't leave the house at all. And he will become like a Howard Hughes meets, um, meets Big Edie kind of person. That's so funny. You know, that was, that was the brainchild of my last girlfriend and I, my, I've been with Barbara for eight years. So it's been a long time, but my girlfriend, Emily Connor was a, was a huge fan. Uh, and she knew Albert Mazels and them. And we actually went to the last screening of gray gardens that Albert Mazels was at before he passed away. Oh and yeah. They were older. Such, huh? It was such a big deal and so much fun. So now that room, is uh, my girlfriend, Barbara Klein. That is the spare bedroom where she sleeps because she lives with a guy who snores. <laughs> so so <laughs> it's been redone. It's so funny because <clears throat> they've used my house for four different television shows. And mo most recently, the, I don't know if you ever heard of the show called The Other Two. It's the dirtiest mm -hmm. show. It, it's on HBO. It used to be on uh, Comedy Central. <clears throat> and HBO picked it up. So, of course, if we're going to be in it, we want to watch it. We watched the whole first two seasons. And it is so outrageously dirty and sexy and crazy and over the top. And then they came and shot at my house. And we're actually the whole season, season three, episode 10, the season finale is all inside my house. And that Grey Gardens room that's now Barbara Klein's room. The guy's agent's mother is dying in that room. She's lying there, <laughs> dying. And you look in, and it, it used to be my cousin Lenny's room when he visited, and then it was Great Gardens, and now it's Barbara. And there's an old broad dying in there. I'm like, so Jesus funny. Christ. <laughs> What's really great is there's a 
sign on the side of my door that says Martlings, come on in or come right in. And the guy goes to find his agent who's in the Hamptons and my house yeah. is supposedly in the Hamptons. And he's knocking on the door and on the side, there's the sign. I had one of the guys that interviewed me for the documentary. He texted me and said, was your house in an HBO show? I, said, Why? He said, I just saw your name on the side of the door. Is that, and I said, well, I didn't know the episode had played yet. That's said, amazing. Yeah, no, they, they, shot, they shot the season finale of Blue Bloods here. You're kidding. You know, and nobody knew that was my house. It was really great fun. I mean, pony rides. Oh, yeah. All right, I have more questions. I, they I have more questions. I got, money. I got rapid fire here. All right, the house ahead. makes more money than you do. <laughs> it really um, does albums and doing albums and doing joke albums do you think they still <clears throat> lend credence to comedians or has it become just like the streaming services and offering people a shit ton of money and making what they can or is it that so many comedians now have podcasts and that's how they kind of get their jokes out there like do you think the album is still important i i, <clears throat> I don't know i don't know any of those answers i do know that every single person Watch my special on Netflix. Watch my special on this. Watch my and people. You know, it seems like if you wake up and say, "I think I'll be a comedian," and by that night you have a special. You on know, Netflix. Way back, <clears throat> I mean, I worked my ass off for the razor blade and tapes and spliced together. Even when I made my first couple CDs, I was still using razor blade and everything, putting out CDs. And I put out six CDs when it was still break your balls to get them out and sell the CDs. Whether it's important, you know, I have so many club owners and why they would complain to me. They say, listen, I had a guy last week. He has 70 million followers on Tic Tac or whatever that, you know, the Tic-tac, older guys yes. will say, no, they got, they got, you know, 300 million hits on Facebook. And I had this guy in, he didn't get one laugh. I'm like, well, why are you telling me you're the asshole that booked him? The idea is to be a comedian. And it doesn't translate. The, it doesn't translate. Get, they do something with that. And that's the whole thing. This show that they taped at my house is called the other two. And there's a guy in the show business, their whole lives. And they're such losers. And they have a 12 year old brother. He's on the playground. He records a song into his iPhone. I want to get married during recess. And overnight, the song goes worldwide viral. Viral. And he's an overnight <laughs> success. And, and, and here's these two, older kids that have been killing themselves and and it's this crazy family and uh what's her name the girl from yeah i never can remember molly i always go to say molly ringwald whatever shannon? her name is molly from saturday night live molly shannon, shannon and she's yeah and it's and she's the mother and it's and it's so great but it's so typical you know because of course after the guy recorded that 12 second song he didn't have anything else to back it up you know, of course not. People used to say, <laughs> don't go on Carson if you got seven minutes. Go on Carson when you have seven minutes and another seven minutes and another seven minutes. So if he tells you to come back in six weeks, you know, you spent your whole life you got getting fresh those material. seven minutes. You got to be ready to, you know. <clears throat> do they so play got... you on, do they play you on Sirius on the Comedy Channel? They used to play me so much that, you know, there's a, when they first started, um, serious it wasn't serious xm yet and i used to go in and my friend phil iazetta had a show on raw dog uh called phil's not really a show and it was at yeah. noon and it was a it was a, a show like you'd call up and say play bruce springsteen or play the beatles but it was comedy <clears throat> they call up and say play dice clay play yeah. red fox so he had me in every once in a while because no matter who they called in about i had a story about them because I interacted with everybody and it was always such fun. And um, at some point, they wanted me to be the voice of Raw Dog. Doing, I'm Jackie Marling, how you doing? That was Red Fox. And now coming up, here's Dice Clay. Just interstitials. It was going to be for a lot of money. Much less than I was making on the Stern Show, but a lot of money now. And we actually it. had the contract. And then Toby, who was representing me, my dear friend Toby Ludwig, he called up and said, Jackie, they just took the deal off the table. I said, well, that sucks. Why? He says, because they think they're going to get Howard Stern. <laughs> and I said, you know, Toby, why don't they just say, we changed our mind. We're not interested. 
because there's no way Howard is going to leave terrestrial radio. Because to me, the entire show was dancing around the stupid rules. Right. You know, not saying fuck and not saying right. cunt or anything like right, the idea right, was right. saying it without saying it. Like people say, oh, you're going to come over to my house. You can't be dirty. I'd say, I, for 15 years, we were never dirty on the radio. People forget. You know, I didn't get beeped one time in 15 years. But I thought it was all bull. And then three months later, you know, here's the New York Post. Howard Stern signs with Sirius. And I was like, well, at least they weren't lying. You know, at least there was justification there. So, and, wait, uh, so, th- so then when you did Joe Cons, then, was that like a... You said in the documentary that you actually went to dinner with Howard? That was on Howard 101. And that is such a such a weird... That involved Tim. God, I should have asked him about I wanted this. to talk to him about that, but of course he had to run. I will never know. <laughs> Sirius is a, is a whole, two whole floors. Yeah, and I know it. One end, one end was the Howard Stern studio. And then, and then you have the fishbowl and the reception. Of, and, yes. Right. And then on beyond that are a million little studios right and phil iazetta's show was all the way at the end and i I would go in there it's funny because over the course of every time i went to see phil somebody say hey jackie you gotta see howard's studio and they take me down and show me the studio as it was being created yeah and so i've been in it a million times but no you know the stern people didn't know that so you can tell me how calculated or absolutely random this is but I mean, Phil was all the way at one end and Stern was all the way at the other. And we get done with Phil's show and we walk out the door and Gary standing there. He says, hey, will I see the new studio? I'm like, sure. <laughs> so we walk all the way down and he shows me the studio, which I, you know, oh, this is so all nice. Right. And it really Great. was. It was so beautiful. So beautiful. He shows me. And I, we walked out of a different door <clears throat> that went into the Stern offices. And Tim was standing there. He said, hey, Sabian, how you doing? Yeah, I'm, I came aboard here. You know, uh, he said, you got a show on Sirius? I said, no, but you know, of course I'd love one. Nobody's ever offered one. He said, we got to get you a show on Sirius. And so he hemmed and hawed. And then uh, I don't, I, I, at some point they said, well, you really should talk to Howard. So I got to go out to dinner with Howard. It was so, I get myself in so much trouble. He I I went to dinner with him two or three times at this little tiny Italian restaurant right next to where his apartment is on like 67th and Amsterdam, whatever it is, right near the park. And uh, it's a little Italian restaurant. And the back, there's like a little, you know, like like a garden, maybe enclosed or whatever. And there's a little door leading to it. But it's like old time New York City when people were little. So here's this doorway (laughs) and there's like curtains above it. And of course, they're going to put us out in the back alone because he's a big star. And we go walking through the door and he smacks his head on the <laughs> over. I fucking laughed. And he got, he was so pissed off. And the whole time we're sitting at lunch, I keep looking at the welt and laugh. And he's like, you son of a bitch. I'm like, Howard, if Fred hit his head, you and I would be pissing our pants laughing. So For about an hour. <laughs> yeah, and, he, and, he's, <clears throat> and he actually said to me, he said, you know, I owe you. And I said, listen, and I owe you, you know, he says, so what do you want to do? I said, I would love to have a show, you know, like uh, Tim said, you should have a show. So I said, yeah, I'd love to have a show. So then I spent a couple of trips in there with uh, Tim does. I know it's going to open, but finally I walked in one time and I looked up at the schedule for Howard 101 and Tuesdays, I can still see it between five and six was a blank space. I see that. That's my show right there. He said, all right. And I, and I, out of a clipless guy, I called up Ian. I said, I'm going to do a show on Sirius. You want to be my partner? You know, it was like asking somebody to marry you. And then we did the show. It took us four months to get paid the first paycheck. We, they said, we're going to start you with this, but then we'll pay you decently. The pay never increased. That went from bad to worse. After How seven much were they years, $1,000 a week, which was for one hour. And it was going to be uh, for both of you? a week. Yeah, a thousand dollars for the two of us, and they would replay it five or six times because it was so funny. <clears throat> and then after like seven years, I think it was, we decided, you know, we're going to walk in and tell Tim we want more money, or else we're not going to do the show anymore. So Tim took us out to Gallagher's, and before we got a chance to open our mouths, he said, "You guys, I, I got to cut you back to once a month." <laughs> <laughs> 
It's not like there was any other programming going on on those stupid channel. Like, I don't understand. You know what? We'll keep doing the show once a week and you just pay us a thousand dollars a month. We both, me and Ian both love doing the show. Fuck the money. Who cares? And we kept doing it. So, but we did it for eight years. I saw people write on, on Twitter or whatever it is, you know, yeah, Jackie had a show on Howard 101, but Howard yanked that pretty quickly because it wasn't any good. I said, yeah, pretty quickly. Eight years we were there. Eight years. I didn't but realize it, it was it, that long. But it became, <clears throat> you know, that's that was the genesis. Walking out, running to Gary, going to the Stern, walking out, running to Tim. Of course, it generated to Jackie went hat in hand and begged Howard for a show. <sighs> and who cares how we got there? That's how we were there. But that, you know, like typically that was such horseshit, but who cared? You know, I was like, you know, it was weird, but so what? Was there any metrics whatsoever? Is there any metrics whatsoever in Sirius for ratings? Like, do you know anything about how well you do? We, I'm sure they do, um, but we never knew. I don't think we would have been there eight years if we weren't doing okay. Right. But I don't, I don't know that. We had so many people, we had a, <clears throat> original cast of Jersey Boys singing. We had Pat Cooper. We had Sid Bernstein. We had Bobby Slayton. We had so many fun people. I the people from what was that horrible show in New Jersey with the with the mutt weightlifter guys and the Vinny the chip whatever. Oh God. And we just had so much fun on the show. And it was solid dirty jokes from beginning. Joke, 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 joke. And oh and, and you know, sad, you know, they'll never be repeated either. Like, that's a show that... And I have them all. I have them all. Ian's like, you know, we really should replay them. I said, yeah, well, there's probably five minutes of one show that could be played now. You know, Are you allowed to? Uh, Which would be amazing. Oh, you should. That was that was part of the deal after, I think, two years. I said, listen, we're not getting paid anything. Uh, I want co-ownership. So I could actually play them anywhere I wanted. So, you know, that and that oh, was I have pretty a, decent. I know? have an idea for you for that. Um, okay. Okay, Jackie Puppet, who has that? <clears throat> that is the greatest question. Do you know the whole st- I don't know if you read my book. You probably didn't. The story I... of Jack did, when Jackie Puppet went missing? Um, yes, because, well, so the Jackie Puppet was, well, Gary Puppet was kidnapped, and then the Jackie Puppet went missing. So yeah. there are two do, classic do, stories. Do, but do you remember what happened? No. All of a sudden, somebody, while Harris, Howard was on Sirius, I don't know how long he'd been on Sirius, uh, you know, in his studio there, <clears throat> somebody must have said, where's the Jackie puppet? And, you know, I, I didn't listen. I didn't know any of this. And they said, well, you know, where is it? And nobody knew where it was. And then somebody said, you know what? When we were moving from, from, uh, from K-Rock, there was a couple times Jackie came in to do shows because I went into, it was called Free FM for five minutes. Right. And they gave me my own show for two minutes to let me audition. And I sat down with Penn Gillette and we did an hour. And after an hour, his wife said, you got to do another hour. You guys are so great together because I'm, I'm decent on the radio. So, and I went back there for a couple times. I forget to, to guest on this show or that show. And they said, you know what? I think it was in a closet. I bet you Jackie stole it. So eventually, <laughs> in no time at all, Jackie stole the Jackie puppet. Jackie's got the Jackie puppet. And this gets back to me. And I'm pretty annoyed because it's just so absurd. And I, if this was so great, I took one of the pictures I had of the Jackie puppet and blew it up to the size of the Jackie puppet, cut it out and mounted it on cardboard <clears throat> and then held it. So it looked like I'm holding the Jackie puppet and like a, like a kidnapping, I held up a copy of the post with the headline to show the picture was brand new. <laughs> and I sent the picture to Steve, uh, whatever his name was, from Howard 100 News and Gary. and said, all right, all right, I got the puppet. I don't want the puppet. Come get the puppet. They found the puppet. They're all exciting. They're excited. They're going to get in the Stern 100 News van and come out to Babel and retrieve the Jackie puppet. And I couldn't, and I called up and said, listen, you couldn't do it, right? fucking morons. Of course I don't have the puppet, you idiots. I wouldn't have known. And I said, but I got a great idea. And I said to Steve, I said, here's what you do. There's that moron that Howard used to have on once a year, once every five years, that was a lie detector guy. Get him to sit there with his lie detector 
I'll go first. I don't care. I'll go first <clears throat> and have every member of the Stern staff one at a time ask them if they've got the Jackie puppet and you will flush out who's got the Jackie puppet. And Steve, what's his name? Steve. Oh, I forget his name. He's a real nice guy. He just interviewed me for Blue Bloods. He said, that is such a great bit. I can't wait. I'm going to I'm going to go to Howard with that. That'll be such a great on air bit. The next morning, Howard came to work with the Jackie puppet. Oh. And it, and it was never mentioned again. The whole idea, the whole bit, Jackie stole it. He had completely it. he had it the whole fucking time. And you can't get mad at that because how great is that? I mean, it's it's brilliant. But he he didn't want people looking at the Jackie pup and saying, Remember how funny that was or how great it was when Billy worked that you know, it was you know, it's like you say, you know, it's it's mirror mirror on the wall. Who's the funniest one of all? It's I have Howard. a cute it's little Jackie and Billy, right? You I, have know. A, I have a cute little video for people who have seen the documentary and probably don't know the history of it. It's a little bit doctored because obviously I don't want to get in trouble, but it's just I just cut this together just to show people because I was just amazed. I was just amazed at. Billy West doing the Jackie puppet whilst you're writing bits for the Jackie puppet to rip into you, which I find fascinating. But this is just a little touch of that so people can see. And it's uh, like I said, it's not we'll just show up at our but... door with something called the Jackie puppet. Oh, boy. I thought you'd appreciate The Jackie it. puppet. <laughs> and evidently it's unbelievable. I haven't seen it. The Jackie puppet. Oh, there it is. Oh, my God. That is unbelievable. <laughs> That is that Jackie. Is Never mind the Jackie puppet. By the way, best puppet ever made. Ever, ever, ever. Um, I love the story that you actually knew about the puppet before the guy came in, but because you didn't want to be blamed for being the one that says, oh, look, there's a puppet of me. So we had the guy come in, right? That's the story. Okay, I love this. But who's the broad? Ta his name is... A nice. Name Good. You can That's talk over it. Go Tom and Amy live on Center Island. They, they live... Uh, about a mile from me, and he's still a very, very good friend of mine. And oh, you're I kidding. came home one day, and my friend, Billy, my friend Billy Bourne, his truck was there, and I said, "Hey, Billy, how you doing?" And I walked up to the, his truck, and Billy's sitting there, and Tom was sitting there, and between them was this little Jackie, with a joint in his mouth, <laughs> holding a Budweiser that was an old tomato paste can that they put a Budweiser label on. <laughs> And I said, what is that? And Tom said, well, you know, there's a Gary puppet. I figured there should be a Jackie puppet. And this guy took a lot of clay and sat there. And in an afternoon, he created that guy. You wouldn't believe what a genius this guy. And he's the greatest guy. He's a dear friend, of course, now. Genius. I wish he'd make him another one for you. I got to get into the puppet business. You people make puppets. Is that what you do for a living? That is an unbelievable puppet. I love it. Jackie, tell me that's not you. Jackie's bond. Oh, look at that. And there's Jackie's little bond. Oh, he comes with a bond. Oh, my God. And the belly. And the belly that blows up. Do you make puppets for a living? Uh, no, I'm a three-dimensional designer. A three-dimensional oh. designer? Yeah, yeah. That sounds like I need that on my movie. Well, Jackie's definitely three-dimensional. <laughs> yeah, look, look at, at that. that. Isn't that a remarkable? It's got one great other feature. Oh, uh, uh, but you know how Jackie's weight fluctuates? I just yeah. thought you'd appreciate this. I wasn't sure when the last time you saw this was, but I, I just thought you'd appreciate how cute it was. Oh, look at that. It goes that. up and down, Jackie. Oh, my God. That is Ooh. unbelievable. <laughs> how bad does Jackie want to bring that home with him? <laughs> how many farts? You blow up his stomach and you press his stomach and he farts? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey, Robin, I hate Howard. <laughs> he, uh, he also has a number of quotes on his shirt if you want. Let me see what it says here. Out. Oh, there's 922 wine. Jackie's 516 wine. <laughs> I want more money. Jokes, jokes, jokes. Buy my stuff. <laughs> I'd like to apologize to my wife, Nancy, and I owe my career to Howard. Uh... All right. <laughs> Hold on. My last little bit of it is where... Um, is where Billy is doing it, and and you're literally passing him a note to do this. <laughs> the fifth floor deck of the health wow. talking about a suicide. Joining her East 57th Street building at 6:30 last night. Jackie, nude body. <laughs> oh, stop it! She no. apparently tumbled from the 15. 15... <laughs> I'd still do her. <laughs> there you are, passing. <laughs> 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 I love that. I love, I love that. That's like actually shown somewhere. Like Billy's, like you know, he's passing me notes to basically rip himself a new asshole. I love it. It's so great. 
<clears throat> and and uh, Billy and, and Tom said, you got to take this in and give it to Howard. And I said, I cannot take this in because if I go in and hand this to Howard, he's going to say, oh, look, it's Jackie no. with one more Jackie toy to promote exactly. Jackie and he will throw it in the garbage. Absolutely. I said, you got to show up like you're fucking with me and maybe bring a girl. He said, well, I'm married. I said, really? He says, I, I got a beautiful blonde wife. I said, that is so perfect. Just wait a couple of days and then show up. And I'm sitting there one day and Gary goes, hey, Al, this is the guy I love. He got a dummy. Looks a lot like Jackie. And he got a really <laughs> beautiful girl with him. And how did bring him in? The guy came in and I was like, get that thing out of here. And he's winking at me, you know. Oh, it I was love just, it. I it love was just it. spectacular. And, it, and it, nobody it, knew that, that for a long time. But if you know the show, show, you know. There was no way. If I had brought that in, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have got across the street, you know. And Billy West said the same thing just, too. First off, Billy is brilliant. Okay, and um, he said something like Howard didn't realize that it was a team effort, and he unfo I love this. He unfortunately fell under the weight of his own hype. Yeah, I, that, you know. Yeah, that's, that's it's uh, just. Uh, yeah, but fell under the weight of his own hype into a hundred million dollars so you know he yeah, no shit he wins you know, he at the end of the day of course it's not even like uh it, it wasn't but, but an the issue trick but is to be able to this the trick is to have somebody to be able to say hey look at the money i got if there's nobody standing around you you know if a, if a tree falls in the forest with a hundred million dollars but there's nobody to share it with you know but i don't yeah. know and he might have, have a thousand friends right now. So I wish Tim you know, was on because he will tell you the fabulous story about how when, uh, you know, Howard reached some sort of demarcation and wound up with like an additional, let's go with $10 million bonus, something, some mark that he achieved, whatever. And uh, Tim had gone to him and said, hey, Howard, you know, now would be a great time for you to share the wealth with this little extra bonus that you got, you know, just give a little bit to the guys and just, uh, and, and he just said, no. And that was that. And, you know, it's just, it was just very <clears throat> indicative of, you know, he who has the most wins. And so I guess he did. Do you know, do you know the story of George Clooney? No. Years ago, a couple of years ago, I just heard this story a couple of months ago, but I guess a couple of years ago, George Clooney took 25 paper bags <clears throat> and went to his bank. Okay. And he had a dinner with 25 of his friends that were really good to him his whole life, his whole thing coming up. And he, you know, he fought for, for a long time, you know, on soap operas and doing whatever. And, you know, he got to the point where he started a tequila company and sold it for $350 billion two days later. Just, you know, he just, just rolled. Yeah. Wait. Go ahead. <laughs> so okay. he's, he's print, printing money. So he has a dinner. And then he says, I guess you're all wondering why we're here. And he handed everybody at the dinner a paper bag. And each paper bag had a million dollars cash in it. Not only that, he had already paid the taxes on all the money. He says, I just want to tell you how much I love you all for your support. And I said, Jesus. I wonder if Howard will ever hear that story. And somebody said, no, Clooney was already on the show. And he told Howard about that. And Howard said, you know... I don't think I could be that generous. <laughs> Jeez, do you think? No shit. Jesus Christ. You know, wow. God, yeah. if he woke up and sneezed and sent me sent me a million dollars, it would change my life, you know? And it, he didn't have 25 people. He had me and Fred, you know? You know, and you Rob, know what the you beauty know, the is, deal. though, Jackie? You can take comfort in the knowledge that, you know, you at your age and Howard at his, which is going to be 70 in January, right? You know, here's a man who... who never experience his life he'll never travel he'll never go on a yacht and go somewhere spectacular in croatia he'll never go to a museum in rome and see things beautiful by the way that baba buoy thing is freaking hysterical with the fountain uh, i and don't i don't know that you really think he's not doing any of that i mean he doesn't do any I gotta, of that I, he doesn't i do gotta believe that. that is that is his girl his wife rather is, is taking him out and that he's no. doing stuff i i hope he is you know babe no Believe it or not, me and him used to have so much fun. Like, like after he was getting divorced, like he just showed up at my house a couple of times. A famous story where he showed up at my house with this stupid dog. And every dog knows how to swim. And we went down to the beach and I jumped in the water and the stupid dog jumped in the water and swam after me. And he spent two months telling everybody that I taught his dog how to swim. Which I thought it's was a Labrador. Of course, it knows how to swim. <laughs> just, 
but so great. And then when we went to Hollywood Squares, he didn't take Fred, he took me. And we're on the on the MGM Grand that was around for about maybe three years. Yeah, and we sat nice. there and watched movies and I drank Bloody Marys and we laughed our balls off for like four four days. I mean, we were bosom buddies. He had fun with me. That's that's why it was so weird. Forget money, forget anything. When we were doing that show, it was fun for him to have me sitting in there because we were breaking balls and laughing at everything. We were sharing a brain. So for him to say, no, I don't want to meet his demands. I'm telling you, Monique, it had nothing to do with money. I'm telling you right now, it had nothing to do with money. Because uh, for whatever reason, I, I, like he wanted to go on without that crutch or without, you know, I, I don't, I really don't know, but it was too odd. Cause if, if you've got more money than you can ever spend in your life and you really enjoy doing your show because of the guy they're making you laugh four hours a day, at what point do you say, get rid of that guy? You know, that it, it'd be a really interesting question to, you know, to, for somebody to ponder with him and find out really what was thinking. He might have just said, you know what? I'm sick of that fucking guy. I've had enough of his stupid laugh, which is fine. Just say that, you know. Just say that. But, you know, here's the, <laughs> the thing it. for today, for today's show. And, and, and think on this. He has 70 people on staff to write and produce and make bits. That's 70. Seven zero seventy people to run that show. Are you are you making that up or you? I am absolutely not making that up for three hours a day, <clears throat> three days a week, with all summers off. Seventy people. Wow. Well, you know, <laughs> the bright Come on. side of that is all those people are making a living or almost making a living. So, on some level, maybe he's sharing the money. You know, it, like. But, you know, we were a shoestring and me and him and Fred I know, were a shoestring. I know, I know, I know, I <clears> know. <throat> 70 people to make that happen now. And listen, after being on air almost 40 years, whatever it is, there's got to come a point where, you know, you need a little bit of a crutch. And I get that. I understand that. But the show is basically bits now and interviews and, and stuff like that. So it's really evolved into something that the reason I do a show is because I, I feel like I am the I am the voice of telling the story of Howard from from the person we loved and we idolized and we drank the Kool Aid and thought was the most amazing thing since sliced bread to the person he's become now. And it, it's not your place to tell <coughs> you know, about the shit that you think he might be, but it's mine. But there's plenty of people that have come down on me, like by just talking to you and going on the show. This is me yeah, in a manner suck. of speaking, still still sponging off of Howard's name and sponging off his show. But I'm a whore. I'm here promoting my documentary. And I love the fact that you like it. And you and I are friends. And I really could give a fuck. What I really like is Ian has sent me a bunch of comments people have made. <clears throat> and even the left-handed ones, like, I never liked Jackie, but holy Christ, that documentary is great. I got to admit, he got my four bucks out of me. Or like, who knew Jackie was that interesting? And, you know, because people say, oh, the funniest thing about Jackie was always how unfunny his act is. But man, what a likable guy. Who even says that? Even though they start off, they're, 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 these are comments. But even if it starts with a left hook, if it ends with a kiss, I'll take that. Because, you know, they, they got to be slow to, to, to give it up. You know what I mean? It's okay. We'll take so, it. And so how many shows right, are you doing? Right. How many comedy shows are you doing now these days? Like, have you kind of stepped it down a little bit or? Yeah, it's, it's you know, I always tell people I'm retired until the phone rings. Exactly. <laughs> but like, <laughs> like July 27th, 28th, 29th, once a year I go to Boston and I do a bunch of shows with the king of Boston, Lenny Clark, one of the funniest guys in the world. And the fact that he loves to work with me each year, I just, it, I take that as such an honor, which I hate that word, but it's me and Lenny Clark and Steve Sweeney, who's been around as long as me and Christine Hurley. And we do shows at this place, Giggles. And uh, Giggles is actually where I recorded the first half of like my fifth CD. And one of the opening things in the CD is, I'll tell you, there's a lot of things I love, but there's nothing I love more than telling my jokes to you fucking drunks here in Boston. And they go <laughs> berserk. You know, like, you know, yeah. So wait, so you're doing that next week? <clears throat> July 27, 28, 29, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Oh, it's it's next probably week. sold out already. <clears throat> but uh, people come out and 
I love the people that come out. You know, they come out and they have albums that they bought 30 years ago or a CD they 20 years ago or a ragged shirt that they won 15 years, you know, and it's it's just great. Or I, people come with their 25-year-old sons, you know what I mean, or daughters. And it's, you know, it's, on one hand, it's great. On the other hand, I'm like, Jesus Christ, I've been around way too long. You know, yeah, crazy. and that's what I was going to ask you. So here's my final question. So all that paperwork, <clears throat> all that ephemeral shit that you got going on in that house, what's its legacy? What do you do with that? What what does, what I does don't one know, do? But I have all, every note I ever wrote for Howard is in my mother's attic. And I mean every single thing that he ever said. I didn't say the things he didn't write, uh, but every every phrase or thing, and I'm talking going back to Mrs. Roselli with the hairy back and Snapple and Wood Ye and Ted Kennedy and Elvis, all those things that were written on the fly and I also have all the scripts to all the bits that are in Howard's handwriting because me and Fred would sit there and pitch ideas and he'd write them down. I know this stuff is worth gazillions of dollars. Oh, my God. You I'm know what looking. you do? You, you take you take 100 pages, random pages, just 100 of them and bind them into a thing and do limited edition and just throw them out there. We can do it. Well, on one show. of these days, if I, if I ever need to. I actually have a couple in California that I want to come out here with a U-Haul and get all the notes and take them home and and they want to pay me a lot of money and then if it makes a lot of money they'll give me a cut and i'm sure i'm going to say yes but it's it's a weird parting you know but i know i got to get the crap out of my mother's attic jesus christ you yeah, wouldn't believe like i think it shows it 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 shows it in the documentary i mean there's piles and piles and piles and, but and even downstairs, a, you have piles and piles. You have stuff. Yeah. You have like lots of shit going on all over the place there. And you, you know, at the at some point, you got to take advantage of it. I know it's like taking your newborn and throwing it out and and hoping somebody buys it. But I get that they're your babies. But you know, at at some point, you don't just want. You, you know what it is? You don't want to drop dead tomorrow, and then all of a sudden somebody looks at that attic and says, "What the fuck am I doing with all this shit?" You know? Right. Well. <clears throat> Maybe somewhere there'll be a super fan. They'll say, you know what? I'll give you a couple hundred grand. Give me what you think is. And I'll give them the five loose leaves of all the five loose leaves. You have 4,000 of them, five loose leaves. (laughs) No, but I mean the ones with the actual scripts, like the Al Sharpton bit and the, and the, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Woodstock with the three stooges and things like that. And how (gasps) it's handwriting, you know, Jessica Hahn meets, uh, meets Rocky, the squirrel. And, oh, and it's, and it's all right there, and it's so fun. You know, Wait, you, a, you, did know, this, the... you did the script of Larry Fine at Woodstock? Well, me and Fred, yeah, of course. Oh, of course. The best. That, that's also in the top ten of everybody's all-time favorite things in the whole wide world. It's so funny. Hey, yeah, uh, why don't you set yourself on fire? That's a good idea. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Yeah, it's fucking funny. You know, <clears throat> before she died, June Foray, actually called June Howard Foray. Yes, not, yes, yes. N- not to play the Rocky the Flying Squirrel bit anymore because uh, I think in the bit it was Rocky the Flying Squirrel I think he bangs Jessica Hahn and <laughs> what does they one of the football players or wrestlers happened to be in the studio the same day so it was the oddest it was June Foray and I forget who it was and Jessica Hahn and who could invent that combination it just, you know, <clears throat> people ask, well, what's some of the weird stuff that happened? There's so much stuff not in the documentary. We were sitting there one day, maybe this is in there, and all of a sudden, boom, through the door at like six o'clock is Sam Kennison, Pat McCormick, this big, monstrous, hysterical guy, Jack Riley from the original Newhart show, and Chuck McCann, who was a wild man, but he was a kid's talk show host in the 50s. <laughs> and they are out of their minds they were in LA and Sam said you know what let's go do the Stern show I got my plane and I got lots of coke and they got on the plane and flew to New York and came busting into the show and me and Wasted. Fred are sitting there and here's the Mount Rushmore of comedy you know Sam Kinison and Chuck McCann and Pat McCormick and Jack Riley and it was like it was fucking surreal I mean that's the kind of thing I don't even know if it's a little funny and that was probably lost on the listeners. That was probably before the E show. Right. But like in my mind, like what a day, what a day, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, 
Well, that's, you know what, that, that's 15 years of, of a life that, you know, anybody else's would be their entire life. So it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to have had and to, and to <clears throat> still appreciate and to, and to be able to relish. My, my dog has a big, gigantic horn on the floor. Um, all right. So I think I'm done with my interview with uh, Jackie Martling for today. <clears throat> I'm so excited I hope that you, you came are happy on. with it. I'm so excited well, that you came it. on and I love talking to you, as I you know. Do, I will do it anytime. Uh, the easiest way to see the documentary is jokemanmovie.com. There's all the connections to Apple and iTunes and Amazon. It shows you right where to go. Jokemanmovie.com. And it seems like it's doing really, really well. Knock on wood. And uh, I couldn't be more thrilled. And I've been going nonstop for about two weeks and this is my last interview before i sleep for a few days so yay so excited it was so now where am i ta i'm talking to you in pennsylvania i am in pennsylvania yeah where i moved out of the city um i'm in northeast pa so i'm about two hours from the city and uh i come in every so often just to kind of you know hang with my friends and whatever but it, during covid it just you know, you know where I lived. I lived on the, the west side, not too far from where you were. And uh, it just got really expensive to, to be there and have a place that I wasn't going to be at, you know, for months on end. So And scared. Yeah, I lost my apartment, too. I spent a whole an entire year. I never stepped into the building a whole yeah. year paying rent. <clears throat> not getting so I had to get rid of. It. So when I you go to. into the city to hang out sometime, let me know. I'll come meet you guys and we'll have a few laughs. I love you. I love you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you um, for, for being my friend and for just being who you are. And I really appreciate you. I just want you to know that. I appreciate it. Tell, tell Grace I'm still stalking her. <laughs> Is she still your friend? No, I haven't spoken to her in years. That's okay. I don't, whatever. That was a fun day. All right. I lo love you, Monique. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. All right, sweetheart. Take care. Hey guys, thanks for hanging with us tonight. Please join us for any further discussion at RadioGunk.com in the forum section. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at RadioGunk. And don't forget to like this and subscribe to us and hit that little bell so you know when we're doing a new show. Thanks. 